Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Luis Sanz. Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello. Hi, everybody, great to be here. How about that? So, ladies and gentlemen, Pierre Lebot, a big hand for him. Okay, on air, that's fine, good. So welcome to this different session. We hope it's going to be of your liking. We thought we need to share knowledge. That's what we come uh, to conferences for. But there are other ways to do it than the classic format. And maybe uh, this arrangement and this sort of uh, TV talk show can also be an interesting way to do it. So today I have four very interesting cases for different reasons and of course some uh, four very powerful uh, hosts so i'm going to ask our first our first uh, uh, sorry guests i'm going to ask the first guest janet walker to join me on the stage janet please <laughs> Very good. Janet, you come from the UK. That's correct. How fascinating. Let's talk about Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now, Janet Walker is director of Cambridge Science Park, and of course you know very well what I'm talking about. Uh, she spearheads marketing, community building, master planning. She has a degree in law and French, and a postgraduate diploma in European marketing. And she started her career in international business development, if I got it correctly. You served as a project director at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. You created a strong sense of community. You helped attracting some companies, including big names like AstraZeneca and the like. You recently negotiated and you were very instrumental in securing a 200 million pound investment in your park from TOS Holding of Beijing, China, which is a member of ISP. Well done. But let me tell you something. Uh, you're not yet an ISP member. If you had been a member, that investment would have been twice as big. <laughs> Herbert Chen just told me, so take a good note of that. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, Cambridge Science Park is in one way or another, but it's clearly a legend in our industry. And uh, what I would like you to share with us is a little bit whether this big brand uh, uh, has, mean, has meant uh, some problem for the development of, of the park throughout these years. I mean, living under the shadow of such an institution like Cambridge University, has that been beneficial, but maybe also not so much? What can you... I know you're leading the park since a couple of years, mm -hmm. more or less, but you surely know the history. Can you tell us about this powerful brand, what sort of role is playing in, in the development of your science park? Certainly. First of all, I'm very privileged to be taking part in this um, conversation this morning, so thank you very much for inviting me. I think I should start by telling a little bit about the history of the science park, Please. because that will put everything into context. So the first milestone dates back to 1546. Some of the members of the audience may have heard of a very famous English king called King Henry VIII. Unfortunately, he's best known for having chopped off the heads of two of his six wives. But on a more positive note, he also founded Trinity College. And at that time, he endowed some land to the college. If you then fast forward to the 1960s when Harold Wilson was the prime minister, he was advocating that this new breed of high-tech industries should locate alongside world-leading universities. So Trinity College fellows got together and they thought, well, that's a jolly good idea. We should do something about this ourselves. So they said, well, we've got that plot of land to the north of Cambridge. We've not done anything with it for decades. In fact, for centuries, let's turn that into a science park. So they did that. They applied for some planning permission put in some infrastructure, and then frankly sat back and waited to see what happened. 
and that was almost 50 years ago. So the freehold of the land is owned by Trinity College, and they've sold pockets of that land to different long leaseholders on 200 leases. So that's a little bit of background. The college is part of the university, but it isn't the university itself. So the university provides the teaching, the departments, the schools, and the college provides some pastoral support and some academic support. So although it's part of the university, it's a distinct and separate entity that has its own governance bodies. All right, all right. Okay, good. But have you felt, again, coming back to my original question, yeah, the background was needed. But, uh, uh, okay, when you mention Cambridge, typically you think of the university. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the Cambridge Science Park fit in that legendary story? Mm -hmm. Is there a specific space for you there, or you feel somehow... Uh, obliterated or, or overpowered by this brand in terms of developing your own brand, making yourselves known to potential resident companies, mm -hmm. etc. Or on the other hand, no, no, that plays to your advantage uh, all along. So relatively speaking, Cambridge is quite a small place. The university is only home to 18,000 students. The city itself has only got 110,000 residents. So it's a very compact, highly networked city. The Science Park has played a pivotal role in what we call the Cambridge phenomenon. And this is the term that we use to describe the transformation of what was essentially a market town with a world-class university into one of the hottest technology spots in the world. So I think the park has made a, a pivotal, played a pivotal role and continues to do so even though the city is evolving at a very rapid rate. Very good. Now, since the times of Henry VIII until now, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. <laughs> How is the park uh, adapting as, as it evolves to these new times where other sort of spaces for innovative mm -hmm. companies are emerging like mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you adapting? What things of the original uh, blueprint are you keeping? What things are changing? And most of all, what do you feel that are your main competitors nowadays mm -hmm. in terms of being an attractive place to attract companies mm -hmm. to the place? So I think the thing that we have done right all along is to focus so the focus of the park is on innovative research and development. There's a little bit of manufacturing, but not very much. So we're very picky about who we want to have on the park. Um, we've been maybe too reactive in the past, where we've reacted to inquiries, rather than saying, we want to have this company or this particular subsector come and join us. So that's one thing that I think we, we will do more of in the future. I guess we're coming under threat, as we heard yesterday in Jonathan's, Jonathan Burroughs' presentation, from these new city centre-based innovation districts. We are an out-of-town science park. We're about a mile or so from the city centre. So I think if we stay on focus, we should be building a greater sense of community. So this is a major piece of, of my office's work programme is to great, create a sense of community. So we want people all over the world to associate the Cambridge Science Park with a place that people genuinely love. They genuinely love to work there. And that's because they're consulted on everything that we do. We run social events, so it's very sociable. We run personal development programs. We're inclusive, we try to cater for every need. We're innovative, so we've got a very significant smart agenda. So all of these components, hopefully, increasingly, will set us apart from the city center innovation districts. So very much around partnership, community, collaboration, and a sense of belonging, and doing good for mankind. Good, all right, very good. One crucial aspect in the life of any project of our industry, park, technology park, science park, areas of innovation, is how the governance is uh, organized and architectured somehow. How is your model? I mean, how is the park governed in terms of ownership, management, board of directors or equivalent body? Can you tell us about that? 
So we're fortunate in that we've got a quite simple governance structure. The 152 acres of land, the freehold, is owned by the college. And as I say, some of those pockets of land have been sold to long leaseholders. So we have my office that sets the strategic direction of the park and the work programs. We work very closely with Bidwells, who are the managing agents, and they advise the college on their investments, uh, not just the science park, but their other investments. And they also manage the estate, the property and planning. So I develop the work program. I present that to the senior bursar of the college. Unfortunately, he usually says, mm, very good, just, you know, get on with it. <laughs> He's then responsible to the college's council and they meet every Friday. So any major decisions such as the Tuss Holdings partnership or investment in new buildings would go through the college council. But generally, it's a very streamlined and quite simple process, which makes life nice and easy for me and my colleagues. Good, very good. Uh, one last question, notwithstanding the fact that we may engage in, in further conversations with the other guests. Any regrets? Is there any decision that you made or that your board of directors made that you said, mm, maybe that was not the right one? Mm -hmm. If I had the possibility, I would do otherwise. Any blunder, so to speak, that you yeah. would like to share with us? So I think one thing that we failed to do, and it's partly because the park evolved organically over the decades, was that we didn't articulate a vision and a mission for the park. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first things I did when I arrived. I basically said, what is our vision? And once we had articulated that, the members of the park bought into it. Then we articulated a mission statement. How were we collectively going to go about delivering the, the vision? So I think for new parks, it's really important to get that vision articulated, get your roadmap um, sorted out, and get buy-in. People that are really passionate and will share that, and will go on the journey with you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we were too property focused. It was all about filling property rather than creating that dynamic community. So much of the work that we do is around community building. And I think the third thing probably is around engagement with the members. So talking to them, listening, and then reacting to their requests. And in addition, the local community, bringing your local community onto the park, getting them to engage, even, even if they don't understand the science, if they can understand the application of the science to how they lead their lives and how it will improve their lives, then you have a much greater sense of a wider community. And finally, if I may, you may. what we have found is expect the unexpected. There is never a day when something doesn't come into our office where we think, oh, Gosh, we didn't expect that. So expect the unexpected. Um, you will have surprises, some nice, maybe some not so nice, but crucially, have fun as well. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Janet Walker. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. And now, I, watching TV, shows and, and presenters, I learned that a gig they like very much to do is this sort of thing, so I wanted to do it too. And now uh, our next guest is Anton Grashev. Anton, will you join me on the stage? Welcome. Thank you. Please. Very good. Now, Anton has been the CEO of IT Park since 2013, and IT Park is in the city of Kazan, or Kazan, that's also pronounced that way, depending whether you are doing it in Russian or in Tatar language, in the Republic of Tatarstan, in the middle of the Russian Federation, somewhere just exactly between Moscow and the Urals. I was there recently. I was... Uh, uh, overwhelmed by uh, the unbelievable amount of history that you can immediately see as you walk the streets, the landscapes. It's a harsh place. I mean, let me tell you, in winter you can easily freeze your eyebrows if, uh, if things get tough. So one wonders, wow, that, that, that is some place to, to live. Then you have these fantastic landscapes, the city is just alongside the famous river Volga. 
it's really uh, an amazing place to, uh, I recommend the visit, it's, it's really beautiful. Uh, the ICT Ministry of the Russian Federation famously said that IT Park in Kazan is the most effective technology park in Russia. Now, I'm not going to ask the opinion of other Russian colleagues that are present in the room. Let's leave it here. But that's what your ministry said. Okay. Anton has a degree in banking, economics, and marketing. He began his career in the LMT Investment Company, after which he was soon appointed deputy director at Treasury Department in Tatfon Bank, one of the largest banks of the region. In 2008, he started a new challenge in the car retail business, became the COO of Autolife Group, in 2012, he, uh, 2012, became involved in IT, appointed as COO in the Center of Information Technologies of the Republic of Tatarstan, where he managed the project of the future IT capital of Russia in Nopolis. Member of the Global Shapers Community, speaker of the World Economic Forum in Davos annual meeting in the section of Shaping Davos, pioneering change in the fourth industrial revolution, and now leading the IT project. Very good. Uh, Anton, Tatarstan, as you, lo you look at it from a global perspective, is a quite a unique place, right? It's a, it's a relatively small place within a colossal federation, colossal in terms of demographics, in terms of uh, size, uh, uh, you know. So uh, one wonders, okay, why in such a context and relatively far away, depending from where, but relatively far away, why did you decide to create a technology park? Was it to, to bridge the gap with the more developed regions in the country? Was it to exploit particular strengths? Uh, can you tell us about it? Yeah, thank you so much for hosting us today here and for this format. I didn't know that you are a huge fan of TV shows, and so <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's really nice. Uh, so for sure, Russia is a huge country, and uh, we have large area with different uh, conditions and uh, really when you live in condition when in winter you can frozen your eyebrows and on summer you can hit as hit by a sunstroke you should be on alert every time so that's that's uh, that's the thing that really uh, really um, gives us some strengths and you always should be focused on some new things that happens in the world and historically the region of Republic of Tatarstan is uh, between European and Eastern part of Russia and for that reason uh, at this area at this area of the country uh, there's lots of things happened during the last uh, 1000 years and Kazan itself Kazan is a city with 1000 year old history and uh, that gives some uh, unique advantages to this area uh, and uh, also one historical fact that is very important to understand uh, why our technopark, why technologies are being developed quite fast in, uh, in this area is uh, not so many people know that during the Second World War in the uh, Soviet uh, Union, uh, when it was risked by uh, being uh, conquered uh, of Moscow and St. Pete, some of big enterprises and some universities, they moved to Kazan. Okay, and that yeah. should be understood. And uh, for these reasons, uh, has been created new, uh, new universities, new technological universities, new enterprises. And uh, uh, today, Kazan, with 1.3 million uh, people population, uh, we have uh, 170,000 students, and we have lots of universities. We, we have the lots of numbers. talents who come not only from yeah. the region, from that area, but also from some other regions of of Russia, from some other countries, and. Uh, for sure, I think uh, uh, the idea of creating such technological area and technological park, which name is IT Park, and its focus on IT, uh, that's that's quite clear because at this period of time when uh, we created IT Park in 2009, uh, this was uh, the period of growth of IT, of technologies uh, in the world, and we know that lots of the things happened in, uh, in this area and companies uh, have become sh showing their huge uh, capitalization growth at, at this period of time, and I think that focus has been done. So uh, let me just sneak in here. Yeah. Seen from today, do you think that deciding to specialize the park in the IT sector is still a wise decision? Uh, you mean at the period uh, of time when we supposed to do yeah, this? Yeah, uh, today you're running the park today and you say, well, it was good that we decided to go on the IT sector. It was altogether a wise decision. I'm not implying any answer. It's, it's a straight question. 
uh, I think at this period of time that uh, not at, in 2009, not so many people understood why we focused only on, on, only on IT. Uh, but today, IT is like an air, and uh, digitalization is everywhere. We see that this just, uh, it's not uh, one sector itself. It's not uh, self-sufficient that it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. It's everywhere. So for that reason, um, I think it was very strategically nice solution to make this focus at this period of time. And right now, spending 10 years from establishing the IT park, we can see lots of results, <laughs> especially uh, in uh, digitalization of government in our area. And the Rep Republic of Tatarstan was the number of number one in Russia region who started its own e-government services for the people. Yeah. And mm. uh, the the LTE has been started in, uh, in Russia in 2000, 2010 in Kazan, not in Moscow, not in yeah. St. Pete. So yeah. that, that's, right. that was quite a nice but solution. Spe I think. Speaking of IT, uh, when I visited your park, uh, uh, one, of the, one of its main elements is this, this big, very well equipped uh, data center that you are operating very successfully. And you yourself told me that's an important element in our overall budget, I mean, a substantial part or a big part of our income comes from this fantastic data center, which is running at full speed. Now, that is a 100% government-funded project, if I understood correctly. My question is, how fair is that to private sector companies that may be interested in competing with you? I mean, isn't that hindering the creation of private comp uh, data centers? Uh, how can you tell me about that? What can you tell me? A good question. Uh, it reminds <laughs> me one uh, good uh, speech of Ronald Reagan, and he said that uh, the most terrifying words in English are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's quite, quite about that you, <laughs> that you, uh, yeah. uh, that's quite about what, what you're saying. For sure, uh, IT Park started by, uh, by budgeting from the regional budget, from federal budget. Uh, and 2007, when this solution was, was done, uh, I think there was no in investment. It, it, uh, the private investment in this sphere had, couldn't be happened because nobody knows why IT should be focused in some strength. And uh, during five years from establishing of IT Park, it's become self-sufficient and right now government doesn't subsidize it. And during the last five, six years, we are, we are working like a normal commercial area and our data center is growing. Uh, and answering your question, uh, I think in 2007, 2008, um, for sure nobody will inv no, no one will invest into data centers itself because uh, it was lack of understanding of this area. Yeah. Uh, but architecture of data center today is quite old. <laughs> And I mean the data center in IT Park, and for sure it's like uh, today it's, we have situation when, uh, every, for example, everybody drives in electric cars, and we are still driving on gasoline, and uh, that's something that gives much more advantages to someone who started this business two, three years ago, and uh, we compete really with data centers, with commercial data centers, which which happened in uh, Republic of Tatarstan also. So that doesn't give us some big advantages today. For sure, it was 10 years, o 10 years ago, this question was quite uh, popular, but right yeah. now I think I no, no one said this. One thing that caught my eye when I was visiting there is this. Uh, it seems to me that you clearly understand that, of course, you have to uh, work hard to attract companies, but another element that you have to do as a science park is to get involved with your community and have your community get involved with you. And you have this program in which you uh, attract children and you organize like competitions for them to, to suggest innovations. And amazingly enough, as I learned, uh, th these are not just some nice ideas that you put them in a little booklet and then they... Some of them have actually been implemented by the industry. I think there is a, a, a big uh, truck company or something like that that has actually made use of such, such suggestions. Can you tell us about it? I think it's a fantastic uh, experiment. Yeah, uh, definitely. We work a lot with, uh, with companies and uh, that was our focus. And uh, the focus of IT Park a few years ago was only companies and we did not put attention a lot for uh, people who are not uh, right now working in company, who doesn't own its own company and we work with like business, it was B2B area. 
Uh, and when, the, when we understood that IT and all the technological growth right now is happening uh, very fast, if you pay attention to the talents, if you pay attention to the young people, especially in IT where uh, t techno technologies are being developed so fast and uh, our generation uh, cannot be so fast as uh, young people, for example, who study at school, who study at university. And for sure we started our own business incubator activity and we did not put some limits for the age. So we work with everyone who has an idea. And uh, at the beginning we received few, the first application from people 25 years old, 30 years old, 35. And then the, uh, the age of uh, applicants uh, was decreased and we started to receive some applications with interesting ideas. But, and I didn't mention we work in business incubator at very early stage, like pre-seed stage when company doesn't have uh, even business. Uh, they just started creating their MVP. They did not have their sales. And everyone right now knows that he can come with us with idea and we can uh, help him to manage this idea. And uh, finally, the youngest company in our incubator was owned by a 14 years old guy. So he started at school yeah. uh, and uh, he found some friends from his school, schoolmates, or I don't know from where, but they all were from 14 to 16 years old. And during one year being in incubator, he's been uh, accepted by our experts. And during being one year in incubator, he created a business with uh, not so big revenue, but anyway, they started earning money. And that was a great example for everyone around. So everybody understood that, okay, I can do the same. And we started promoting this success story. And uh, people in uh, school, they are very focused on these success stories today because this PR is happening very fast. Social media gives this, this uh, chance to be promoted <laughs> immediately. And uh, for sure, right now, we support different initiatives. Uh, and even we understood that we have support not only business, not, not only business ideas, but we have to work with children from seven years old to give them understanding of what technologies do we have today? How can you learn them? How can you manage all these things that happen right now in this digital world? And right now we have a program which name is IT Academy and we help people uh, of different age to start developing, to start coding, and it really works. Right now we graduate hundreds of people every year and they've been um, uh, hired by some of our teams, some of our companies, and that happens uh, every day. And all the time we're trying to increase this right. attention to these young talents, to young companies, to people who want to uh, realize their ambitions locally. And I think that's quite important, especially because we are not in Moscow, not in St. Pete. And uh, basically before our activities, lots of people moved from Kazan to the capital because much more chance to be successful. But right now, it decreased the, the amount right. of people who want to move there decreased because they understand they, that they can be realized, they, their ideas and they can yeah. <coughs> their ambitions can be done here. So that's... All right, All right. very that's, good. That's why. Anton Grashev, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so yeah. much. And now let's go to a completely different part of the world. Let's call somebody from Texas, Bill Sproul. Welcome, Bill. Take a seat. Very good. Okay. The region boasts thousands of companies, which form several business clusters, including advanced manufacturing, defense, financial services, semiconductor, software and telecommunications. This concentration of high-tech firms makes the Telecom Corridor one of the top three technology centers in the United States. Several influential aspects of the community support this development. A strong economy, an excellent educational system, a highly educated and experienced workforce, a diverse transportation infrastructure and a business-oriented government all contribute to a stable foundation for growth. Good. Bill. Bill is president and CEO of the Richardson Chamber of Commerce, its North Texas affiliate tech titans and the Richardson Economic Development Partnership. And this unique and complex set of organizations he runs has two separate boards of directors and the city to whom you report. 
You've been the leader in state, national, and international economic and technology development. You served six years on the board of the Texas Emerging Technology Fund, which is a half billion investment fund, which you chaired during 2010 and 2011. You were elected chairman of the International Economic Development Council, the world's largest association for professional economic developers, in 2014, and you served on its board for 10 years. You held senior economic development positions in Dallas, McKinney, Texas, and in Kansas City, Missouri. Tech Titans inducted uh, you as the inaugural member of its Hall of Fame in 2010. You hold a degree from Baylor University with a double major in economics and political science. And there is one question that I just wanted to ask you since we decided that you would be here with us regarding the Richardson uh, project. Now, why a Chamber of Commerce? Wasn't there anybody else to launch this project, a university, some major corporation? If I ask that, it's because in many parts of the world, the Chamber of Commerce, it's a special sort of creature, and sometimes it's difficult for us to understand he's the role of, to be, of that institution. He's trying to be polite. Yeah, I'm doing my best. <laughs> By the way, before I answer that, Luis, uh, and I think the audience is going to agree with me, um, I know that you're reaching uh, an inflection point in your career. You have a future in Hollywood. All right. Well, that's a, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to talk to Jimmy Kimmel and see if uh, yeah, you can't get on the... I consider being my agent. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, I have the contract here. Yeah. <laughs> so it has to do with the business model. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, we're not, we don't own real estate. We're not a business park. Um, we're an area of innovation. And so um, it is natural then, if you're trying to uh, generate new business, that a chamber of commerce that has an economic development function would take a leadership role in developing that ecosystem. And so uh, that's exactly our role. Um, we help to convene the ecosystem. We help to grow it. We bring new companies into it. We help to get investment for uh, emerging growth companies, just like when I was in the Emerging Technology Fund. Um, and you know, we have a particular focus, as you know, in technology uh, throughout our area. Just to level set the context, you saw a video. Um, so we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth region, which is seven and a half million people in the northern part of Texas. And uh, this community of Richardson is about 110,000 at night, but it balloons to about 150,000 people during the day. And so um, uh, it's got this great concentration of technology companies, a major research university, and we're kind of the glue and the catalyst that keeps that going. Very good. Okay. Uh, then we realize why the Chamber of Commerce has this role. How is, in terms, same question as, as, as for Janet, how is your governance uh, organized and architecture? Who's there? Who sits there? Who, who is the major stakeholder, other stakeholders? Can you illustrate us there? I have a lot of stakeholders. Yeah, but um, make a summary. So the, the, the quick summary is that I have a, um, a board of directors that is elected from our membership of 25 people. We have an advisory council that it's an additional 15 people. But we make sure that the university is represented on our board, that the mayor and the, and the, the CEO of the city of Richardson's uh, on the board, um, that the community college folks are on the board, school system people, et cetera. <laughs> so we have this kind of stakeholder model uh, that it's involved in the governance. But for the area of innovation, I mean, it, it's, it's a free bird. Uh, the private sector is uh, allowed to do within the confines of you know, zoning and other laws uh, exactly what they want to do. And uh, so we have this area of innovation. I think there's a map that's uh, being shown uh, that's about uh, 1,200 acres. 50% uh, of all the businesses in Richardson are located there, um, 19,000 employees, and it was the heart of the telecom corridor. And uh, that's the area that we're focused on now in generating again. Good. So uh, you've been with the ISP already for some time. Of course, you, you have... Uh, got to know other projects in the world, you have read things, you have heard, then you know also the industry, our industry in the States, in your, your home country. Even though it's, it's a bit preposterous to ask about an American model, because just as in everywhere else, there are many models. But is there some trait that you think that would probably help us to understand that our industry in America has certain common denominators that make it special or different to other, other parts of the world? No, I think it's a fair question because 
the notion of, uh, so we don't have really government-owned science parks in America. If you think about Silicon Valley, for instance, it, it is not a science park that was established by a university or by a government. Uh, in fact, I mean, Stanford obviously had a big uh, role in its development, but most of it is all private development, private companies. And so, um, and this may be a little controversial for the audience, but that's okay, we're on a talk show, yeah, we yeah. can do this. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make an argument, and I'll, I'm gonna actually be excessive about it. Um, that the model in America, if you think about the triple helix, the quadruple helix of business, you know, a university, government, and citizens, they're not equal. That in fact, business is the most important of those helixes. And that's probably the model that American communities adopt. Certainly there needs to be government support. Certainly there needs to be university involvement. And absolutely we need citizen involvement. But we really think the private sector needs to take the lead because they are the ones who produce the wealth. They are the ones who produce the jobs. Government can provide the framework and the infrastructure. The universities can provide the intellectual capital. And the citizens provide political support. So you're advocating for a sort of asymmetrical triple or quadruple helix model where yes. they, all of the elements have to collaborate, but uh, they're all equal, but some are more equal than others, just to put it in George Orwellian terms, like, uh, good. Okay, I, I would tell you, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. And uh, my opinion sometimes is not 100% very popular among my colleagues, but that's, that's what I think. I think. I think, in fact, very often, you have heard me say very often that when we talk about science parks, technology parks, the name contains the seed of a big confusion because we are not about science nor about technology. We are about businesses, about entrepreneurs, about companies in the context of the knowledge economy. That means we have to provide access to where the knowledge comes from, technology, etc. But we are not universities. We are not research institutions. We are uh, instruments for the supporting private businesses to be more competitive. Good. One particular question uh, that I want to ask you, uh, look, Bill, uh, in some parts of the world, Europe, for example, my, my home place, we are pretty good at uh, incubating companies. We incubate many companies, and many of them sort of, you know, pass the, 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 the first threshold, they even, you know, cross the valley of death. And, but what we don't seem to be too good at is to make it so that many of these companies or some of these companies become really big companies. So when we look around in Europe, it's not easy to find the Googles or the Apples or this sort of thing. I'm obviously now mentioning the big mammoths, but in general, what is it? Can parks, areas of innovation be somehow instrumental in really making so that these baby companies grow up to a scale where we see, oh, that was, that was worth what do you think we can do about that? Uh, well, um, as you know, I grew up here in Europe. I grew up in Belgium, and my father was um, involved in NATO, and I went to school with probably 15 other different nationalities of kids. And so I say this with some level of knowledge about Europe and its history and a great appreciation for it. But I think that there's two issues. One is regulatory and one is cultural. Uh, you still have, even within the European Union, great barriers to being able to take products across borders within the EU in different regulatory and cultural frameworks and be able to scale them. And I just think that that's an issue that uh, Europe needs to tackle. Um, obviously, there's big debate going on, as we know, about Brexit and all these other things. But um, I think if there was a more common regulatory framework across all of Europe, that would take away a huge hindrance. The other thing that's happening in our societies is our cultures are becoming a lot more integrated. And so I think over time that will solve itself. But it's the regulatory barriers between co countries, I think that's the biggest hindrance. Very good. Uh, final question for the time being, same as for Janet. Any regrets? What is it that you would do different now with the experience uh, regarding the development of, of uh, the Euro telecom corridor and the whole area of innovation? Where did you go wrong? Well, the, the mistake was made before I arrived. I had to fix it, uh, but there was other things I'm sure that I'd have done wrong during the fix-it period. And the mistake was to put all our eggs in one basket, which was telecom. And we benefited tremendously uh, from the rise uh, during the dot-com boom, yeah. the expansion of broadband internet, 
and uh, we have the highest concentration of telecom companies anywhere in the world. Alcatel from France, Nokia from Finland, Ericsson from Sweden, Fujitsu from Japan, Siemens from Germany, Samsung from Korea, Huawei and ZTE, they're all there. But when the dot-com bust occurred, we crashed. So in that town of 100,000, 110,000 people, we lost 30% of our jobs That's painful. in three years. Yeah. And so when I got in, I said, you have to diversify. You can still play in technology, but you just can't play in this one space. And I had political resistance to that. The mayor of the town at the time told me, Bill, you've got to rebuild our telecom infrastructure. And I said, Mayor, it's not going to happen. That market's gone. Uh, now, we still have great assets that remain from it. So um, that would be the mistake, is just to focus on only one sector. I think you need to be broader. You need to find ways of lateraling out uh, to other sectors and kind of grow the economy from there. I'd say, you know, uh, during my time, uh, the only regret is uh, I didn't push harder and quicker uh, for some of the change. All right. Well said. Very good. Bill Sproul, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Sproul. Thank you. Okay, now I need to put my notes in order. Here we are. No. Our last guest for the morning com, uh, from, comes from Italy, Salvatore Majorana. Please join me. Benvenuto. Prego. I think you recognize the tune. Do you want to join the pianist and sing? or? Uh? I, I would, mm, would not suggest to the you, audience you to listen to that. Yes, yeah, so. okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right, uh, Salvatore, whom I know well, he's the director of Kilometro Rosso, which means Red Kilometer, an innovation district in the heart of Lombardy, northern Italy, one of the most industrialized regions in Europe. The focus of his work has always been transferring research to the market, and he has also a great deal of experience in managing uh, patents and patent portfolios, IP licensing, and tech-based startup creation. He served as Director of Technology Transfer at Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia, a top-tier research center active in the fields of robotics, materials, and life science. He is an engineer from the University of Catania, Italy. He was a visiting scholar at University of California, Berkeley, and gained his MBA at INSEAD in France and Singapore. He serves as an expert reviewer for many European institutions including the European uh, Research Council, the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, member of the board at the Digital Innovation Hub of Bergamo, also in Italy. He teaches courses on innovation and new business development, and he's a renowned speaker on these topics. And Salvatore, the main reason that I wanted you to be here is because you represent a project that somehow it is a rara avis. Now, for those of you whose mother tongues are, are not deriving from Latin, let me tell you that, that that's an Latin expression that means a unique thing, a, a weird bird, a strange thing. And that is a 100% public or a private owned project. Uh, you're not the only one. Interestingly enough, this approach, this uh, growing interest of the private sector into our industry is beginning to take off slowly, but still, I mean, very uncommon. So what I wanted to ask you is why? What's the reason behind the creation of uh, Kilometro Rosso? Well, yeah, um, I may say there is a real vision of give back. The entrepreneur, uh, the, the park is owned by the family uh, of um, a, um, very successful industrial person. Uh, he has set up the uh, renowned uh, brake company Brembo. And when he was moving his, uh, his company in the area, he realized that uh, he had to uh, set forth as a pillar in his strategy to innovate his business. And the second uh, idea was that innovation should not come from inside only, and should come from uh, entertaining relationship with other companies. So it actually bought the land uh, and developed the concept <coughs> as uh, a boost for both his company and the territory uh, along, uh, along um, I mean, the whole territory around. Um, and many say that might have end up into a speculation on the, on the land, uh, just to anticipate that. <laughs> and uh, 
I may say that that is not. That is, I mean, numbers say that uh, there is no such speculation. He could have put his, his money someplace else with, with much more successful in financial terms. But yet, uh, a private program uh, encounters a lot of obstacles uh, uh, when it comes to create uh, science parks, to be I honest. I guess, I guess that what you're, you're preventing is the some, somehow typical accusation coming perhaps from the left-wing ideological spectrum of, ah, those are, those are very nice words, but you don't care about the community. You just wanted to make sure that the land you own raises in value, and that's why you created that project, and you don't care about anything else. And you're saying that's not true. Yeah, that is but not I, true at all. And, I believe uh, you. Uh, um, and, and, and the, I mean, numbers uh, speak for themselves. Uh, yeah. He started the program... Uh, in early 2000, and then uh, we began running operation in 2009. It was the worst year ever in the in the past 20 years yeah. uh, because of the crisis. In fact, land yeah. went down in terms yeah. of value. So that is not the point. He kept investing, and now we have uh, 1,700 people working there, uh, more than 65 between research centers and companies. And so this is actually a... a a systemic approach uh, that he set forth. And it's amazing that it was driven by private uh, investors without yeah. the attention of the public in our case. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, I firmly believe that it is great news for our industry that the private sector says this is a good thing in which we can invest too. It happens, as in your case, as a 100% private investment, but it's increasingly happening under PPP schemes of various forms in which suddenly the private sector jumps in and decides that we can invest in these type of projects and expect a reasonably good return of investment. So I think it's a great news. Yeah, you give me a chance to uh, point out uh, an interesting part of uh, the PPP scheme. Uh, I know uh, IASP uh, has been working with JRC on, yeah. uh, on that. And uh, the one thing I didn't see in the presentation we had yesterday, which might be in the, program, in the, in the report, uh, but we need to take care of it's in there, is the one small model of the private sector starting the park and the public getting attention to the private initiative. Because yeah. uh, the, all, all the models I've seen yet is the other, way, the other around. way around. Yes, I mean. absolutely right, absolutely right. But in any case, I think the trend, the projects like, like yours, like Open Zone, by the way, also not, not too far True. away from your place. Not too far away. These are showing trends. this increasingly interest of the private sector. By the way, in your park, when you go there, uh, it is quite clear that you, you wanted to make sure that everybody arriving there realizes, oh, we are in Italy. It's a lot of design, and it's a lot of design, stylish, right? Yeah, it is correct. It, it's part of the philosophy, actually. Having a, a red line running uh, along the autostrada, mm -hmm. which is a uh, very dense traffic uh, uh, place uh, in that part of Italy, um, gives people the sensation that they are switching to a different place, uh, et entering uh, another, another part of their uh, everyday life yeah. where they can dedicate to innovation and uh, thinking freely. In fact, there is no cars beyond the red line. Uh, right. People just walk around into yeah. gardens and uh, uh, nice buildings. And we believe architectures uh, make part of the job. I mean, okay. being in a nice place allows you to uh, feel better and release your uh, free mind uh, in creating new things, possibly. Dude. You mentioned that you missed in this joint report, ISP, JRC, uh, an attention to that particular aspect where instead of the private sector jumping into a public initiative, it's the other way around, as it is in your case. So that makes me think that you, once you decided, let's go for that, then you talk to the private administrations and the public powers and say, okay, do you want to somehow get involved? Do you want to support this? How did they respond to that? It was, um, Tell me the truth. The truth is... Don't uh, lie to me. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was skepticism at the beginning. Should I mention that? Uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> and uh, destruction. Right. They were too busy to do um, uh, a science park in that moment. Interestingly enough, uh, a few years later, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, that weird animal that we mentioned before, started a new park uh, six kilometers away from us. We are in very good relationships, but uh, it's something like the public sector uh, would look at uh, private initiative with uh, some 
um, fear or uh, somewhat a punishment approach. You made your money by doing business. Why should we help you now in creating a community? And indeed, the private sector is creating <laughs> benefit for the community. So it is not fair that the community doesn't give back somehow a support. Okay, a private science park, fine. Would you say that when you compare that to the typical more public funded park, whether in its totality or partially, that entails a significant difference in the way the park is run? I mean, would you say that you have to be or you're expected to be, how would I say it without being too far-fetched, more rigorous in terms of securing that there is a decent return of investment, that, that numbers and hard facts count more than perhaps just uh, abstract concepts such as uh, social value, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that true? Well, to be honest, I don't Without think... Without being offensive towards the no, purely no, no, public... No, no. In, in general terms, I don't <laughs> think any um, um, activity should be run thinking that they can waste resources in a way. Yeah. So this is what we do. We, we, we try not to waste resources and to maximize returns on resources. Returns may be accounted for in terms of economic return, uh, yeah. which is part of our job. So we take care of the, um, of the balance sheet, of course, and uh, all the um, re returns that we should expect from renting, lending, or giving services. But indeed, uh, uh, the general return from uh, creating the community requires a, a long-term view, which our entrepreneur has and has ever had. And therefore, uh, up until, uh, since, since his uh, initiation, Kilometro Rosso has been uh, putting money uh, at service uh, for the community. So our numbers are in balance. We don't get returns in terms of... Uh, Get, I mean, we could be a non-profit organization as well. All right. That's why. Oh, interesting. Okay, good. Uh, in your opinion, what would be the highest value that a science park or an area of innovation should make sure that they provide, they deliver to their customers, their resident companies? Um, I know there are many things, but if you, if you could pick up one that you think that that's crucial, that is what defines us, what would it be? We would be, and this is what we actually uh, try to, pass as a message. We want to be the place where innovation happens, uh, the place where you can be, you can feel there is someone that helps you address your issues uh, and put and connect you with those who those issues can solve possibly. So it, it's, it's a bridge uh, mission, the one we give. Um, and this is happening uh, slowly, but uh, constantly. And if I may pick up from uh, one, a few things that I heard from Anton and uh, Jen, uh, the, there are uh, a few mistakes to anticipate your, your questions. Yeah, it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being the fourth, uh, it's, it's easier in a way. <laughs> a few mistakes that we made as well. Uh, we were too much concentrated to, on, on companies at the beginning. And uh, we are... Uh, our population is made of large, small, medium enterprises, very few startups, and uh, uh, the focus on uh, creating value for companies distracted us from creating the community, which is something we are trying to regain, uh, and we are doing. Uh, and in the past two years, we, we did a, a very good job in uh, creating the fourth helic, uh, which is instrumental to create interest for the third helic, which is the government eventually. All right. Do you uh, collaborate with any university regularly on a strong basis, or is that somehow uh, tangential to your activity? No, no, we do. Uh, there is a systematic approach. Uh, University of Bergamo has a site within Kilometro Rosso, so right. they have their labs and, and their classes there. We have uh, ENEA, which is a research institution dedicated to, uh, in our cases, uh, smart materials uh, and uh, technology for smart cities. Uh, we're building, actually, the, the labs in these uh, very days. And we're signing an agreement with the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia on robotics. Uh, to set this up, we have gained consensus from companies to support financially the creation of this joint agreement. So the, the campus is really becoming the place where things that were not in Bergamo are coming to Bergamo thanks to the fact that Kilometro also is pushing towards uh, uh, them to happen. Very good. 
Salvatore Majorana, Kilometro Rosso, ladies and gentlemen, big hand. Thank, thank you very much to the four of you. I think maybe we can have the lights on so we can see our faces because we are completely blinded here. Can we turn on the lights? Because now we can have just a few questions from the audience to our panelists and our guests. Where is the magic uh, electrician here that will turn on the lights? Uh, oh, it's happening. I think it's happening slowly. A bit more, please, a bit more. So we can, everybody can wake up now. Good. Uh, we will take uh, just a few questions. Do I see any? I don't see anything yet. Okay. Is there anybody? Oh, I see a hand. Oh, Herbert Chen, I think. Herbert, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, exciting uh, sessions. I think we are all thinking about the future. The science park already have more than 60 years history. So gentlemen and ladies and uh, big boys, would you please share with us what happens after 20 years about our science park industry? Thank you. Who wants to take the challenge? Anton, go ahead. Yeah, I'll try to. Uh, I think 20 years is a too big period to plan today because uh, really we see changes during the last five years and lots of the things changed dramatically even for us and I think everybody agrees with this. Um, in my opinion, infrastructure and the role of the infrastructure will be decreased dramatically and because everything is being digitalized and um, connecting of people, connecting of companies and giving them some advantages, giving some expertise uh, can be done uh, even without some <coughs> infrastructures, without some science parks. But I think that um, the thing that uh, I'm totally sure and uh, I totally I'm totally sure that this will happen, that everyone will be connected um, uh, not only by uh, social media, not only by our interests, but also will be connected by our aims, by our habits, by our uh, vision. And uh, AI will artificially connect us and we shouldn't pay so much attention for finding talents, for finding new companies, for finding new uh, good connections between people, but uh, I think the role of AI today is dramatically great and uh, my opinion is even examples of business incubators. Five, ten years ago most of these uh, infrastructures were offline and this was okay come to our incubator you will have a seat here and okay that's fine. Today that we see that uh, the role of infrastructure decreased and we see lots of virtual business incubators, lots of uh, activities that uh, are much easier supporting these new companies and uh, the, uh, we don't have this level for entering to this market. You don't need lots of investment to start this activity. So that, that's, that's how I see it. Did you want to add something, yeah. Salvatore, to the question? Um, of just to provide a counter view on Anton's, um, on Anton's one. Um, in our cases, we refer to the manufacturing uh, uh, industry and uh, more and more we see that in the science park uh, there are labs dedicated to experimentations. So possibly some infrastructure will remain in terms of uh, material science. Uh, plus I do trust the fact that uh, tech transfer happens uh, if people talk to each other. So proximity and being the place uh, will be uh, still a value for a science park. What I think it will be in 20 years uh, we will be part of the city much more than what we are now. We are considered an external item added to the real life of the city. Hopefully, they will bring us, and this is for Bergamo, no, I don't think it's for Cambridge, for instance, they will bring us the train that takes people to the park, which is not the case. They have to have their own car today, yeah. and uh, we will be integrated more and more, hopefully. Yeah. More questions from the floor right here? Thank you very much. Um, co-workings are now offering services, uh, just more than space. They're creating environments. Some people are starting to go Google size like we work. Um, they don't have labs, but they can create labs. Uh, I think they're a competitor. Is that true? Is that your idea too? Or am I looking in the wrong direction? Janet. Any of the four. Oh, please, go ahead. 
<coughs> Thank you. So we have a new building on, on the Cambridge Science Park called the Bradfield Centre, which is run a bit like we work. But so there are three floors. It's run as a club. So when companies approach us, instead of having a conversation around the cost per square foot or per square meter, it's the cost to become a member. So the psychology from the start is very different. People realize that they're coming in to work in a community rather than just on their own. And you can rent a hot desk, a resident desk or your own office, so there's room to scale. And the idea really is that you don't work in isolation. So the filter is you have to be in deep tech. You also have to be community minded. So if at the start you only want to rent space and not talk to anybody else, then this model isn't right for you and you wouldn't be right for that model. We want people to roam around the building. We want them to sit on the comfy sofas, a bit like these, and to talk to people over the water cooler and the, and the coffee machine. And we have a management group that curate that, that I like to call it managed serendipity. So there's an element of managing it, but there's an element of leaving it to happen um, by chance. So, uh, so I think that is a really interesting model for the future. We've, we've only been open for two years, so only time will tell whether companies are scaling and growing faster as a result of being in that community as distinct from the, the, the more conventional model for co-location. Bill? I would say that it's complementary, it's not competitive. In fact, um, to Herbert's question earlier, I would think that you would all, all those operators of science parks are going to have to have co-working space as a part of their real estate offering going forward because it's a different kind of company that's going to be in there with different needs. But uh, to Jeanette's point, um, there's this, you know, hopefully curated um, a set of introductions that the operator of the co-working space can make. The best one I've seen in the United States is the Cambridge Innovation Center right across the street from MIT six different floors in a building, and it's designed in a way to cause accidental collisions. And um, they also have many programs, they have a venture cafe, they have 15 different institutional funds, uh, a lot of big companies in there, uh, but uh, those entrepreneurs, principally, are looking for that kind of very energetic environment. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, science parks need to understand is that the millennials don't want to sit in an isolated office. They want to be part of a community. They want to feel that energy. And they want to do something that we, at least we call live, work, play. I can live close to where I work and I can play near where I work. I can take the train to, you know, my location. And I think that, you know, ultimately, to Herbert's uh, question, your science parks are going to look a lot more like areas of innovation. They have to do that. They have to have that community around it to be vibrant. I will add on my own something I think is interesting. We've, we've heard two interesting uh, syntax expressions. Manage serendipity, accidental collisions. Uh, true, that's happening, but I would like to remind you all that that is at the origin of the concept of Science Park itself. We used to talk about fertilization croisée, and that was exactly it with another name. You're just putting people together that by being close to each other with a proper environment, they will talk and things will happen. So. It's not exactly new, and sometimes we are under the impression that we are inventing things that for, uh, uh, generations before had already thought of. Regarding the phenomenon of uh, these new spaces for millennials, I've visited many of them all throughout the world. The narrative is pretty much the same. I think it's something we must keep an eye on, incorporate it to our, our uh, parks, etc. But for the time being, I also think that there is more noise than results. I mean, I, I'm still waiting to see whether the real result of all these swarms of millennials going around with a cup of coffee and a Coca-Cola, talking a lot, but then producing exactly what in terms of uh, revenue, in terms of jobs uh, created, etc., is uh, still probably too early. There is noise. There is smoke. There must be a fire. We have to watch it, probably incorporate it, but let's not get overwhelmed and hypnotized by something that's still not quite there. I think, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our session. Please remain here because the conference is not yet finished. And I would say, Maestro, hit it. We'll meet again. Thank you.